Right, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Jim Donahue from Adobe. And um, where are the... Let's see if we can get the slides up. So he'll be talking about Flint, uh, which is about how to deploy Spark and Shark and other things from the beta stack on, uh, on Amazon oh, AWS. All right. Okay, thank you. So um, I, I have been playing around with Spark for around a year now, and I've, I've kind of become the Spark and, and in general the uh, badass uh, evangelist inside Adobe. So one of the things I've been worrying about is how do you effectively evangelize the uh, software stack inside our company and what I've been looking for is some intrepid and curious users who want to experiment. I work in Adobe Research, so I can't get anybody to do anything because I say so. They, they have to get enthused about it. And so, and, and of course, when you start talking about curiosity, curiosity is always tempered by the cost of startup. And uh, so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is how you minimize the cost of getting up and running with Spark and Shark on AWS. And for us, AWS was interesting because basically most of the data for the kind of experiments people were going to want to do were going to be uh, stored in S3 buckets somewhere. Okay, so here's, here's the basic idea behind Flint. Uh, first off, it was shared nothing. I, I didn't really want to get into the business of managing anything. So it was basically, go get yourself your own AWS account and go. Um, very simple configuration. You want to be able to write a little JSON, run a couple of scripts, and start going. Um, efficient, flexible scaling. For example, there, there's been an awful lot of talk this morning and this afternoon about being able to take advantage of spot pricing. You, you want to be able to do that. On the other hand, you also want to make it very simple for people who don't want to do that, who just want to run a little cluster. Uh, full access to tools. One of the things that got me excited about Spark and Shark in the very beginning was shells. So shell access is a very critical part of, of the, all this. Um, access to all the Spark and Shark tuning parameters, um, as everybody has said, this is right now, this is something that's very difficult to do. And you didn't want to, I didn't want to bury anything in Spark environment.sh so that people couldn't get their hands on it. And finally, since I'm working at Adobe, this all had to be tuned to the Adobe environment. So for example, all the ports that needed to be opened up to gain access to various things had to be uh, consistent with what our firewall was going to allow. So here's the, here's the Flint architecture in one slide. Uh, you have Flint that runs on the client uh, machines and it provides local Spark and Shark uh, access and in particular one of the, one of the things I've, I've done is just trying to make it simple for people to get S3 access without having to remember <laughs> how do you pass your AWS credentials over and over and over again? Um, and then there's a remote access which runs on shells on an SSH server inside the Amazon cloud. The components of Flint actually use S3 and SimpleDB for state management, um, and we'll talk, we'll talk a, a good bit about this. Uh, Flint's responsible for distributing your shared AWS credentials among the components. So if you're running a Spark shell that's talking to a Spark cluster and you want to read from S3, you need to make sure that everybody's got access to the same AWS credentials all the way through. Um, Flint's responsible for managing server, uh, the master, and SSH startup. And the slave, in, interestingly, um, un, unlike the uh, EMR talk previously here, the slave elasticity is managed by the master. And we'll talk, we'll talk about how that works. So 
I, I have a problem with slides like these because they look wonderful, but the real question is, how did you get that to come into existence? What, what happened that caused all these machines to come into, into existence and, and all the data to get stored? So what we're gonna do is actually walk through the, the entirety of setting things up with Flint. So first off, you have to, have to do some basic things. Um, I, I need your AWS credentials, and using those credentials, I'll, I'll set up a bucket for you uh, to hold some jar files. Um, I'll create a, a, some simple DB tables to hold some state, and then set up the key pair and security groups and all the rest of that stuff that you need to, to get going. Then you need to do provisioning, and provisioning has, has two aspects to it. First off, you need to define clusters. What, what kind of clusters are you gonna run? What, what are the clusters going to be doing? So you define those through a, a little JSON spec that you can say things like, um, the master instance configuration is X, and I'll, we'll talk about configurations in just a second. The slave instance configuration is Y, and here's the definition of the scaling rule to be used to decide when slaves come and go. Um, a configuration is also defined through a JSON spec, and it includes things like the Spark master uses a certain AMI, it's going to be running a set of services, those services have properties, and oh, by the way, Here's where you will find the jar file that you need to uh, download the, the service code. Um, and what I, what I did for uh, people getting started is I built a set of uh, standard clusters and configurations so that you can, you can get up and running without really knowing much of anything about how this all works. Um, and the other thing that I found necessary to do was to occasionally build my own AMI with all the requisite Spark, Shark, Hadoop, and Kafka bits that were, are guaranteed to work together. Um, okay, so now, now we've got uh, some configurations, we've got some clusters, now we just need to start. And what happens, you on the, uh, on the client, you just run a uh, command that launches, uses the local Flint instance to launch a master. Basically, you, you say, I want to launch this cluster. Um, Flint reads the cluster definition out of simple DB, figures out what it takes to launch the master, and goes, goes ahead and does it. Um, the master reads uh, simple DB and S3 for configuration and code, basically uh, along the same lines as the bootstrapping operations for EMR, um, installs and starts the master services, and what happens uh, in general is starting those services launches Spark and or HDFS uh, through some command line, and then when, it, when the master is all done getting bootstrapped, it puts its connect URL in the database so that uh, everyone can find it. Then when a slave, so at this point, Flint has decided the cluster is, is, has started. What uh, needs to happen next is the master needs to decide how to scale it. So the master, one of the things that happens on the master is it launches a scaling service. And the scaling service simply periodically is asked the question, should I create more instances or should I kill more instances? And, and if I'm going to create them, how much, do I want, how much am I willing to pay for them and how long do I, do I want to make the bid last? So then, assuming a slave starts, it, it basically goes through the same thing. It reads simple DB and S3, gets its connect URL from the master, from simple DB, and then launches uh, Spark and or HDFS workers. Now, to, to start a client, um, you, the uh, user says, I wanna, I wanna launch a client 
of, of a particular flavor, for example, a spark shell, a, a shark shell, a shark server. Um, and the client, again, goes, goes through pretty much the same sequence, uh, starts, ends up starting an SSH server, and before it starts it, it reads SimpleDB for the authentication information and the master uh, connect URL it's going to use. And then finally, the, uh, the client says, I, I would not like to connect to this remote shell. Flint finds the appropriate client. The uh, SSH client is launched to connect to it. And then the SSH server connects on the, to the master on, on the client's behalf. So the other, the last little piece that got added was um, the ability to make asynchronous requests. So one, one of the things you, you frequently want to do is move some data from one place to another. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just to say, um, I will make an asynchronous request. The, the masters all run a service that pulls requests from a simple uh, queuing service queue, and the results and, and progress information get stored in SimpleDB. And the request can include things like move data back and forth between HDFS and S3. Um, I, I, found some, I had some people who were interested in AWS public data sets, and a lot of those are EBS volumes. So one of the things you might want to do is take one of those EBS volumes and put them in HDFS so that you can start uh, manipulating them and then running batch jobs. And one of the nice things about using queues for this is that there's, there's no necessity that, that the cluster even needs to be alive. So it makes it a lot simple, simpler for people who are using this because you don't have to worry about the startup sequencing so much. You can go ahead and run something and when the cluster gets started, it will pick it up. Okay, so where we are now. Um, I actually do have a few intrepid, curious users. Um, in fact, uh, Nadim Lipka, uh, who will be speaking in the next session in the other room, um, is one of, the, one of my users. And, and the big issue always ends up to, do I really want to use Spark and Shark? And so I, I thought I'd pass along at least my sense from what I'm hearing from people who are, uh, uh, I talk to. Uh, SQL is a big selling point. I, I, one of the things that really got me interested in this was I, I have done database programming for a long, long time, and I can't imagine living without a SQL shell. And there, there it was in full glory, and I said, okay, I, I, I want that. Um, Scala, it turns out, has been a mild put off. Um, the guy in the office next to me, I, we were having a conversation just last week, and he said, you know, I think I've learned enough programming languages at this point. I'm really not <laughs> excited about doing anything with Scala, for what it's worth. Um, I, I think what, for us, what will probably settle the issue and get a lot more people interested in, in Spark is Spark streaming. Um, we, and, and in fact, I, I mentioned in the AMI that I, I build, I have put Kafka, and it's Kafka 0 0.8, because uh, that's what we need for some of, the, some of the projects that are getting started. And I think that's, that's gonna be a, a really great uh, benefit and something that will convince people that, yeah, this is, this is what I wanna use. Um, we are having discussions about open sourcing this. Um, of course, one of the problems with that is uh, you need to make sure that there's some interest in this before you start spending any resources on it. So if you are interested, let me know. I will be around today and, uh, you know, I'm looking for intrepid, curious users. Oh, thank you. Questions? Questions? Huh. You mentioned letting me letting you know, uh, but I didn't. Do you have your your uh, contact? 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was on the title slide. I have cards. Uh, Jim Donahue at jdonahue at adobe.com is, is the email address. Um, I take it that uh, you do quite a, quite a bit of the integration work around Spark and Shark. And uh, have you looked at the Apache Big Top as an integration point and the framework for you? Uh, no, I, ha I haven't yet. I, uh, what, what happened was um, when I started doing this, there, th basically um, it was figure it out yourself. And I, I haven't had any chance to, to go back and, and look to uh, find better ways of doing this. But it would be nice. Other questions? So I have a question also. You said sure. that you know, people are not interested in you know, Scala, yet another language. I don't yeah. want to learn this, and it's, it's too tough. But that Spark streaming might change that. that if, if, you know, right. How is that? How, how does that solve well, that? Well, Spark streaming provides so much valuable functionality that it's, it's a way to convince people that you know, it doesn't matter that you, don't, you, you would prefer not to learn Scala. It's, you're going to get so much benefit out of this that it's worth doing. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. Yep.